Washington Journal continues. Joining us from Duke University is Sandy Darity. He's a public policy professor, and uh, we're here to c talk about reparations and the role they're having in the 2020 elections. Professor, thanks for giving us your time. Uh, thank you for having me. Everybody, I suppose, has a certain kind of definition of reparations. Could you give us yours? So reparations is a program of compensation to individuals or communities that have been subjected to grievous injustices. And uh, from my perspective, reparations has three objectives. The first is acknowledgement of the injustices on the part of the perpetrators. Second is uh, redress, which is uh, restitution for the effects of the injustices. And third is closure, which is a mutual recognition on the part of the victimized community as well as the perpetrators that the debt has been paid. When it comes then to the specifics, how do you calculate something like that? Well, it depends on the particular set of injustices one is concerned about. In the context of the United States, the experience of, of black Americans as potential recipients of a reparations program, I would say that what you'd have to do is calculate the full economic effects of the long-term consequences of slavery, of the Jim Crow period of legal segregation in the United States, which lasted for close to a century, as well as ongoing effects of racism that are manifest in the forms of mass incarceration, police killings of unarmed blacks, as well as, as and perhaps most significantly, the racial wealth gap that is so large and so persistent in the United States. If we're talking, looking at uh, the United States history, particularly when it comes to reparations under that model, who would qualify or at least what would have to be done to qualify? So I would identify black descendants of folks who had been enslaved in the United States as the appropriate recipients of reparations. And uh, in work that I've done, uh, in a number of venues. Uh, I've argued that there should be two criteria for eligibility for reparations. The first is an individual needs to demonstrate that he or she has an ancestor who was enslaved in the United States. And then secondly, that individual needs to establish that he or she, up to uh, up to 10 years prior to the onset, or at least 10 years prior to the onset of the reparations program, uh, self-identified as black or African American or some equivalent category. Uh, professor, this conversation, or at least this topic, has gone on for many a year with various people and administrations, including the in power, including different presidents of the United States. Why do you think it's never gained traction? Uh, I think there's been a tremendous resistance to it gaining traction in large measure because of the way in which we have crafted our understanding of American history. I think a disproportionate amount of American history has been devoted to mythologizing what occurred during the Reconstruction era, what occurred during the Civil War, and mythologizing the case for the Confederacy, uh, leading to hero worship of individuals who actually were traitors to the United States of America. In that process, I think there's been a denigration of black Americans, which has led people to think that there's no just case for compensation, when quite the contrary, there is an enormous just case for compensation, and we have to, uh, we have to rewrite our narrative of American history, uh, particularly with respect to the nature of the Confederacy and a cause that was established for the purposes of maintaining slavery in the United States. Andy Darity from Duke University joining us. If you want to join in the conversation, 202-748-8000 for Democrats, 202-748-8001 for Republicans.
and Independence 202-748-8002, and you can post at C-SPAN WJ. Professor, one of the reasons we brought you on is because this topic suddenly reemerged, or at least emerged in the 2020 presidential can, uh, campaign. Uh, we want to play you comments from Senator Elizabeth Warren on the topic, and then we'll get your response to it. America was founded on principles of liberty and freedom and on the backs of slave labor. This is a stain on America. And we're not going to fix that. We're not going to change that until we address it head on directly. <laughs> and make no mistake, it's not just the original founding. It's what's happened generation after generation. The impact of discrimination handed down from one to the next means that today in America, because of housing discrimination, because of employment discrimination, we live in a world where for the average white family has $100, the average black family has about $5. So I believe it's time to start the national, full-blown conversation about reparations in this country. And that means I support the bill in the House to appoint a congressional panel to, of experts, of people who are studying this, who talk about different ways we may be able to do it, and to make a report back to Congress so that we can, as a nation, do what's right and begin to heal. Professor, what did you think about these comments just being made in the first place? So I think that there, there are two dimensions of her statement, which I view as, as courageous. Uh, the, the first dimension of her statement that I'd like to highlight is her emphasis on the magnitude of the wealth gap, where she indicated that with respect to net worth, the typical white family in the United States has a $100 relative to $5 that, are held, that is held by the typical black family. So that's critical. That's a, a major indicator of the long-term and cumulative consequences of this historical path of racial injustice. And then uh, the second thing I'd like to emphasize is her her focus on uh, House Resolution 40 and the, uh, the necessity of passing a bill that would create a commission that would have the responsibility for outlining the long-term history of racial injustice in the United States and designing a program of reparations. Uh, I would add that as a prelude to the reparations program that was inaugurated for Japanese victims of mass incarceration in the United States during the course of World War II, uh, Japanese Americans, uh, there was a commission that was formed. I believe it was called the Commission on Wartime Relocation location and Japanese internment. And that commission had the responsibility for sketching the case for reparations for Japanese Americans, as well as designing an initial program of restitution. And so I think uh, in parallel fashion, we need a similar type of commission to address the question of reparations for black Americans. Our uh, first call for you, uh, Professor, comes from David. He's in Los Angeles on our independent line. You're on with Sandy Darity of U Duke University. Uh, David, go ahead. Well, good morning, brother. And I must admit that this is a topic Good morning. and a subject that is way, way, way long overdue that we deal with in the serious manner by which um, you're dealing with it this morning. Now, um, with um, the, the senator, you know, approaching the topic the way she did, like I agree with you, brother, was much a noble thing to do. Now, watch this, my brother, as this program progress, where people will call in and say, I, my parents, um, I just got here, you know, um, I'm second generation, and my people came from wherever. We ain't had 
nothing to do with slavery, right? And you also get um, the the garden variety racists who will always uh, um, give the Confederate line about, um, you know, that slavery was actually a noble em- enterprise is the undercurrent of their uh, understanding. So, but brother, I think you got your 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 finger on the pulse of the direction by which we must go with this. But I'm just saying, be be aware of how it is that these various um, oppositions uh, will try to muddy the water. Dave, uh, that's David from uh, Los Angeles. Professor, go ahead. Uh, yeah, well, let me comment. I've already commented on, on the necessity of, of changing the way in which we view the American historical record. Uh, but, but the observation, the other important observation that the caller made is that uh, frequently critics of reparations say that they are such recent immigrants to the United States that uh, they don't bear any uh, personal personal responsibility for for slavery, for example. Uh, uh, they may even have, have arrived so recently that they, uh, they've come after the Jim Crow period had ended. Uh, but I, I, I've got a couple of responses to that type of uh, perspective. The first is if, uh, if an individual migrates to a country, they migrate to its history and to its national obligations. And the national obligation is what's at question, in question here. It's not a matter of personal responsibility or individual responsibility. It's a national obligation that's based on the historical experiences that the United States of America has, has, has undergone. Uh, and I would also add that I, I presume that people who have chosen to migrate to the United States have chosen to do so based on the opportunity structure that exists now. Uh, which is also a product of the level of affluence that the United States as a country as a whole has achieved. And that level of affluence was built on the backs of black American worse labor that uh, that that was uh, w- that went on for upwards of, of three to four generations in the United States after the formation of the Republic. Uh, from Maggie in Socrates, New York, Republican line. Go ahead, please. Hi, thanks for taking my call. Um, my problem with this is that, okay, slavery was a horrible thing, and we, the entire country, I'm sure, regrets it. But what about the soldiers who died to free the slaves? Do their families get reparations? Professor? Um, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. And uh, if, I, I invite uh, the caller to craft a case, if she would so desire, uh, on behalf of the individuals who fought to end slavery. Uh, I have been working on a case that is specific to the historical experience of black Americans. And I would also add that There was a significant degree of participation in the Union Army after the Emancipation Proclamation took place of black soldiers. And a case can be made that the Union would not have won the war without the participation of black troops and the support from the black community that was based on the various outposts that the Union Army had throughout the United States. So, uh, so I, I, would, I would argue that black Americans themselves contributed directly to their own liberation from from slavery. And so, as a consequence, uh, we need to factor that into the reparations bill as well. But I, I invite the caller 
to uh, to do the research and to do uh, and to do the estimates of what the damages might have been to non-black participants in the Union Army as a consequence of the Civil War. That's a separate case. It's not the case I'm working on. Uh, professor, someone else makes the t case on tw Twitter saying, don't forget about the German Americans that were incarcerated on the East Coast, maybe the Irish Americans that were indentured servants after the potato famine. How about the rest of us that got no benefit for relocating and investing our lives to build the U.S.? And again, I invite these callers to design and develop their own case. I will say that one of the anchoring factors that distinguishes the black American experience from the experience of most of the others is that to some degree or to some extent, the other communities constituted, uh, constitute descendants of people who voluntarily migrated to the United States. There is no question that the initial American sin of slavery was associated with forced migration to this part of the world. And I think that that's the foundation for distinguishing between the black American experience and the experiences of other communities in the United States. Uh, let's hear from Jerry in Ohio. Go ahead. Jerry in Ohio, go ahead, please. Hello? You're on, go ahead, please. Oh, no, this is, uh, I didn't go through the screener. This is Joe from uh, Michigan. You're on, go ahead. Okay, uh, I come from a, a unique situation, from a very unique family. I had a grandfather, not great, but a grandfather who fought and was wounded in the Civil War. I'm 83 years old. I tell my brother, you and I are probably the only people who can directly connect to the Civil War with an ancestor. Um, from Ohio, he fought in the 5th Ohio Company G. Anyway, good luck in your quest for reparations. Uh, personally, I don't think it will ever happen. And I'm even more unique in another way. I thought I was black. For 75 years, we did DNA, and I'm actually Scotch-Irish, yet I suffered all the indignities of having to ride in the back of a bus. I suffered uh, everything that, you know, I didn't know. I wish I had known then. Hell, I'd have carried my papers with me. But this is in the 50s I'm talking about. Okay. Maybe I'm rambling a little bit. Gotcha, but... Carla. Gotcha point. Uh, Professor, if you want to respond. Yeah, so... Um... Uh, I, I do want to reemphasize that the criteria for eligibility that I mentioned earlier have nothing to do with DNA tests or skin shade or phenotype or appearance. So if, if this individual has an ancestor who was enslaved in the United States and this individual has, uh, has self-identified as, as, as black uh, at, at some point in time, then they're, they're perfectly eligible for, for, for reparations. And if they suffered indignities that were associated with the way in which others perceive them racially, then, uh, then that would be entirely consistent with the claim for, for reparations. Uh, I, I think it's very interesting that this particular caller has a grandfather who fought in the Civil War. Uh, I think that that is actually not an entirely unique case. Uh, there is at least one individual that we know. My wife and I have worked on a book on reparations, which is forthcoming, called From Here to Equality. And in the book, we talk about the case of, uh, of, of Dr. Hortense McClinton, who was the first black faculty member at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Her father was a slave. And she is still living. She is in her 90s. But her father was born into slavery. So the notion that it happened so very long ago really is not altogether accurate from a generational perspective. We're really talking about the fifth generation of black Americans from slavery on average. But there are clearly exceptions. Uh, Mrs. McClinton is the first generation out of slavery. So, Professor, for this idea of a, a, a reparations a program, where would the funding come from? Uh, 
So uh, any program of reparations that's established at the national legislative level, whether it's uh, Germany providing reparations for, uh, for the victims of the Nazi Holocaust, or it's the United States providing reparations for Japanese Americans, uh, the, the payments or the responsibility for payments would come from the U.S. government itself. So it's a bill that goes to the United States Treasury. There are ways in which this could be done that would minimize or eliminate any additional tax burden on the, on the, national, on the national population. Uh, but that's in the final chapter of our book and I dare not divulge that in advance without risking the wrath of my co-author. Uh, from Bob in Mass uh, Massachusetts, go ahead. Good morning, Mr. Darity. I got something I'd like to run by you, Good and morning. I really would like to know how you feel about this. I understand that, that CNN or C-SPAN is, is doing a, a show about the president, okay, and they're going to they're gonna rate him from best to worst, I guess. Um, I believe that that Lincoln was the worst president. And the only reason I say that is because in our Constitution, there's a line that says all men are created equal. For some reason, the black people didn't make that state, right? And when, when Lincoln had the war to free the slaves, did he say, okay, all of you people can now vote. All of you people can now own land. All of you people have the exact same rights as white people. That's what should have happened. Okay, if caller, thanks. Yeah. Uh, actually, I, I absolutely agree that that's what should have happened. And uh, my understanding is that approximately two days before he was assassinated, Lincoln gave a speech where he said that he was going to make sure that black Americans had the vote. And, uh, well, at the time, it would have been black male Americans because only men were eligible to vote at the, uh, at the point of the end of the Civil War. Uh, but he gave a speech saying that he was going to be fully committed to giving black folks the vote. And uh, John Wilkes Booth was in the audience. And my understanding is that it was at that point that Booth uh, Booth made it made it definite to himself and to his compatriots that he was going to kill the president. Uh, the second thing is uh, the the land was mentioned, and it was definitely in progress. There definitely was a, a there definitely was a procedure underway to provide the formerly enslaved. Uh, in, enslaved black Americans with land. Uh, this is the vaunted 40 acres and a mule promise, which was ne never delivered ultimately. And, uh, and, and the process of trying to provide the formerly enslaved began under Lincoln's presidency with a special order that was issued by General Sherman uh, in, in, uh, in Savannah, Georgia, where, uh, where he was going to actually allot, allot plots of land uh, to the formerly enslaved. That allotment actually got underway, uh, but it was reversed by President Andrew Johnson, Lincoln's successor. And I would argue that it's Andrew Johnson who was the worst president in the history of the United States. One more call for our guest. This is from North Carolina. We'll hear from Jeff on our Republican line. Hello. You're on. Go ahead, please. Yes, sir. Uh, I think reparations is, an reparations is another division attempt. Um, at some point, we have to... You know, every single person, no matter what color they are, can go back and blame somebody for something. It's time to stop teaching incessantly in our public school systems about slavery. It's over a hundred what years old. You cannot keep charging people that had nothing to do with slavery for the guilt of being slave owners. 
it's time for us. Many white people have suffered injustice. We just have to move on. Thanks, caller. So I think I emphasized at the outset that, uh, that I think that the, the, the case for reparations is not predicated exclusively on slavery, that uh, it's, it's critical that we take into account in, in, our, in our calibrations the long-term effects of the Jim Crow period. And I also indicated that there are ongoing damages that need to be considered. And I would highlight among these again, mass incarceration, police killings of unarmed blacks, and the, uh, the immense magnitude of the racial wealth gap. So it's not just a question of addressing the harms of slavery. Uh, I think that, uh, as I've said a number of times, if people believe that there are other communities or other groups that are deserving of some form of compensation, they need to make that case. But this is a case that's specific to the experience of native black Americans. And this experience is one in which I'm trying to take into account the long and cumulative trajectory of injustices that have been imposed upon this community, starting with slavery, but continuing through nearly a century of Jim Crow, as well as ongoing forms of racism that are still persistent to this day. Uh, it is not a question of personal responsibility on the part of any individual. What distinguishes this case is the fact that slavery and Jim Crow were embedded explicitly into the legal structure in the United States and were enacted or acted upon on that basis. Uh, if there are other types of injustices that have occurred, we frequently have certain types of legal remedies for those. But there was no legal remedy for being enslaved. There was no legal remedy for being subjected to segregation or apartheid in the United States because those were things that were written directly into the nation's laws. Sandy Darity of Duke University serves as a public policy professor here for a conversation on reparations in campaign 2020. Thanks for your time, sir. Thank you for having me.